So let me ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2. We'll begin reading at verse number 9 of Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah writing as he, or as this chronicle's given, says, Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letter. Now the king had sent me with officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. Let's just pause there for a second. It's amazing that someone would be displeased at the aid and the comfort for the people of Israel, but they were. Verse number 11. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I rose in the night and a few men with me, and I told no one what God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring, to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up into the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Then I said to them, You see, the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with the gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may suffer no longer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me, and they said, let us rise and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite and the Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper and we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. And may God bless the reading of his word. Um, there, there really are, you know, in, in respect to what we're talking about, about today, there are three kinds of people in this world. There are those who don't have a clue about what's happening, those who watch what is happening, and then there are those who make things happen. And Nehemiah, he was a man <clears throat> who was making things happen. He was a great man, <clears throat> but his greatness comes not from himself, but his but a clarity of what God wanted him to do, God's plan, God's blessing, and God's uh, obedience to God's command made him a great man. Nehemiah was a great leader because he followed the will of the Lord. God's work and our planning are not contradictory. As one pastor said, prayer is where planning starts. We pray about something, we meditate on it, we think about what's going on. And this is what we saw in um, in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Nehemiah. Nehemiah modeled good uh, leadership. He prayed. And now, as we see, he started to plan. And then he acted in dependence on God and submission to his guidance. It's not a contradictory thought to be, uh, to be, to be dependent on God and to put your effort into something. In fact, it enhances it. We need to make sure that when we're researching and we're doing things that, that we bring those things to the Lord. But in essence, Nehemiah, as we see here in this passage of Scripture, God led him. So when we talk about God leading us, what should we mean by this statement? What is it that we should say? This is it. We say God has shaped us. He uses our natural talents. He uses our strengths and our gifts to meet or fulfill a need or a goal. He shapes our desires. Couple with this with the understanding of God's character, learned by spending time in his word, and you have a recipe for discerning God's will and his leadership. <clears throat> Psalm 119, verses 65 and 66 read, You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. 
We pray and we ask him to, to teach us good judgment, to give us knowledge, for us to make wise, discerning decisions. And we pray this before the Lord. It's really when we start to understand the simple truths, we, we realize God's will is more of a realization than some mystical moment. When we think about his will, it, when we look at it from this standpoint, it, his will just makes sense. It's logical. And yes, there are times we have to step out in faith. And Nehemiah, he carefully analyzed so he knew what he must do. But it's through submission to his word. It's at this time as we submit to his word, God changes our judgment and we begin to operate more like him. Wise and prudent Christianity will lead a person to a place where they live according to God's word. When you truly live the word, God transforms your character, your thinking, and your decision making. But there's some responsibility on our part to be conformed to his image. There is there's some sense in which you and I, we submit to this process. God's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. But you and I, in the process of this, we must willingly submit to him. You want to clearly know his will, his plan, and his path? Be submissive. He refines us in this process. And we pursue those traits uh, and thinking about God that will lead us into wise Christian decision making. See, the plan that Nehemiah began to develop was given to him by God. And as it was once told to me in a missions class, the need constitutes the call. If there's a need, and you recognize the need, that may be God's prompting. Because not everybody recognizes the need. See, God chose Nehemiah because he had the skills necessary to complete this project. Nehemiah's desire was a, as a result of gathering information while he served the king's uh, side as his cupbearer. It was his devotion to the Lord that helped him become an exceptional leader. So during this very difficult time, uh, he, as was revealed in this account that we're looking at today, we will see his leadership was focused on the promises and agenda God had unveiled to him through his word, through his promises. So the first thing we need to understand about this man, Nehemiah, is he planned. Uh, a plan of action begins with gathering information. It always begins with prayer. Our first line of defense is always to be prayerful people. We really can't spring into action until we pray. Pastor A.J. Gordon said this, you can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you can never do more than pray until you have prayed. We must pray first. Often people will venture out in a direction that they think that God wants to take them. They kind of, they, they kind of feel like they're cut loose and they find themselves in a difficult situation. That direction, that plan, and that agenda, that, that individual constructed looks right and feels right, but in this scheme of things, it's wrong. Proverbs 14, 12 says this, there is a way that seems right into a man, but its ends are the way of death. We need to be careful as we begin to pursue God's will. Bold, yes. Brave, yes. But we also need to be careful. Now, God blessed Nehemiah's endeavor. He actually received more than he even asked for. Uh, the king sent a contingency of his military to escort him. This military cohort served to, uh, as protection. It also served to convince Sambalat that Nehemiah had the full support of King Artaxerxes. God blessed him even more than he could have ever imagined. So we know who Nehemiah is. We know who he was. He was a Jew who was in captivity in Persia. He was serving King Artaxerxes as his cupbearer. He is also the individual that God called to lead. It's, he's the man that God called to lead. He called him to lead this rebuilding process for Jerusalem. But this passage of scripture mentions three naysayers. Uh, the first is Sandalat the Horonite. He was a naysayer to God's plan. The uh, ancient documents of the day, or that we have today, place him as the governor of Samaria in approximately 408 BC. So evidently, Nehemiah had to travel through Samaria to get to, uh, to Jerusalem. So Sanballat was greatly disturbed by Nehemiah and this contingency that was given to him as his escort by King Artaxerxes. 
The second naysayer we see in this passage of scripture is Tobiah, the Ammonite. Uh, he was probably the governor, and or it's, as it says, the servant of Ammon. He was the governor of Ammon. He was of Jewish ancestry, as you can tell by his name. Now back in, sometimes it's good to read Ezra and Nehemiah together. You get a fuller picture. But in Ezra chapter 2, their Jewish leaders were back in Jerusalem. They had come from, uh, <clears throat> from, uh, from Persia. And they were back in Jerusalem, and they were attempting to reestablish the priesthood. The Tobians, uh, although they were presumed to be descendants of, of Lot's son Abraham, uh, and therefore Jews, there was no proof of it. And so in Ezra chapter 2, we see that they're considered unclean individuals. The Jewish community could not prove who they were. They could not prove their lineage, so they were impure. There was no record of their heritage. And so this is who we see with Tobiah. The Tobias were probably frustrated and furious as a result of this rejection. Can you imagine with a small contingency in, in Jerusalem? And here are these people offering their help. And, the, and Ezra and the rest of the priests said, no, we don't need you. We don't know your lineage. They, they uh, ostracized them in some ways from this very important task. Can you imagine how they felt, how the Tobians felt? So later in Ezra chapter 4, while Ezra the priest undertook this responsibility to build the temple, this, there was a group that was formed to, who, uh, who opposed the rebuilding process. Among this group were those of Jewish descent, and some theologians believe that it was to, the Tobians, who is Tobias, as we see in our passage today, his family. These Jews rejected by the, or these Jews rejected them. These individuals rebelled. And it was here at this time uh, that we see that these individuals, the Tobians, they, they put up their hand, they attempted to stop the process, and they would rather have seen the process lay in ruins. They would rather have seen the temple at Jerusalem lay in ruins rather than follow God. So we encounter people who would rather see the church lay in ruins than thrive according to God's plan. We see this all the time. It wasn't necessarily that the Tobians did not want it to happen. They wanted to be in control. So this account in Ezra reveals they were embittered. They sent letters to Artaxerxes, the king, and he responded, and he caused the construction process to stop. So the rebuilding process could have been going on these 12 years or 15 years. So 12 years earlier, this process was going on, and because of these individuals, it stopped. It stopped in its tracks because of whatever reason. The fact that Artaxerxes sent Nehemiah at this point in time, appointing him governor of Jerusalem and allowing him to harvest timber from the king's forest and allowing him to have this military backup, it infuriated Tobiah, especially if his family was instrumental in the difficulties or the insurrection, whatever you want to call it, that they had earlier. See, there's never a legitimate reason to be a naysayer. How do you know that God was in Nehemiah's plan? How do you know that God was, was leading Nehemiah? Well, it's by the evidence. By the evidence, you see that God is leading and God guiding. We see it here with the king who gave him permission. We will also see it later in the book of Nehemiah, how God blessed him. So how do you know God is doing something? You see the evidence. You see the lives of people changed. You see baptisms. You see new faces. You see all sorts of things that indicate that God is on the move, that God is working. God is always working. Just sometimes we get to participate. God is always working, and sometimes we get to see what he's doing and what a blessing it is. But how do we know that, that God was in Nehemiah's plan? Because King's, King Artaxerxes' heart was softened, and it was in God's time. See, the timing of God's plan is essential. And I often tell people that the timing is one of those matters that reveal God's will. And so God was in this. So the question is, how, what happened with Nehemiah? Nehemiah met his challenges head on. We don't see a specific reaction or his re particular response to the problem. What we do observe is his incessant desire to continue to do that for which he was apprehended. 
And let me, let me make this clear. When you become a Christian, you're apprehended for something. When you meet Christ as Lord and Savior, He pulls you into the body. He gives you a gift, and He expects you to use it in your service to Him. And Nehemiah, he knew what he was apprehended for. What am I apprehended for? What is Kevin apprehended for? Kevin's apprehended to teach and preach the Bible. What are you apprehended for? Whatever area of service that's in the, your heart of hearts that you desire to do. But when God saves us, he calls us, he apprehends us for a purpose. Nehemiah found his mission. One of the most difficult challenges that he faced, and oftentimes we face the very same thing. For Nehemiah, it was overcoming negativism and obstacles. And for us, it's easy to concentrate on the negatives. It's easy to think about the difficulties. It's easy to think about the problems. It's easy to concentrate on these things. The problem is if you do this, you miss out on the blessings of God. God is, God is blessing in so many ways around us. This is what we need to keep our eyes on. And if we focus on the problems, if we focus on the difficulties, if we focus on the negativism and all the obstacles, we forget that God is sovereign. And he's always in the business of bringing us to this place where we acknowledge him. See, the children of Israel, they lost heart when they were in the wilderness. They wanted to go back to Egypt for their leeks and onions. But God told them to press on. Some 12 years prior to this occasion where Nehemiah is writing on this, this letter, Artaxerxes decreed that the Jews stop rebuilding the temple of Jerusalem. And here we see uh, it disturbed Sambalat and Tobiah and Geshem, who we'll talk about in a moment, that God was working to restore Jerusalem. How do we know he was working? He moved in the heart of Artaxerxes. The naysayers who were against Nehemiah, uh, those who were doing, they were against Nehemiah, and those who were doing the work, doing the things that God had called them to do. In fact, they were heckling them. They were belittling them. They were attempting to humiliate them. They were lying about them, disparaging. They were doing all sorts of things just to quell the people, to stop the people, to push them back from doing what God had told them to do. Now, oftentimes with, with the negativism and the obstacles and the naysayers, it's rarely an argument of substance that they bring up. They simply start hurling little statements here and there in an attempt to disparage, defeat, or do something to those who are working to make them feel as though they're missing it. Or it's just not worth it. It's just no, no longer what God wants them to do. See, even in our day and age, some are disturbed when God blesses his work. The enemies of God attempt to stop God's work, not with substance, because there's no leg legitimate basis for their opposition to God's work. They ridicule and they attempt to question the credentials of the messenger. That's precisely what happened to Nehemiah. They were saying, Nehemiah, did, did King Artaxerxes really send you? They were questioning his authority. They were questioning these matters that were God-ordained. In, in reality, Nehemiah was God's messenger. And for these three naysayers, uh, as they questioned Nehemiah, they were questioning God himself. They were questioning God's work. So think about it for just a moment. When someone reviles you as a Christian or as God's people, he, we're reviled. We should be reminded of Matthew chapter 5, 11 in the Beatitudes. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. This kind of reviling is persecution. It's not like you're thrown in prison, you're not in a stockade. It's not like you've been executed. It's not like somebody's chopped off your head. This kind of reviling is, is gossip. Blessed, blessed are you when others revile you, when they gossip about you. Blessed are you when others revile you, they slander you. Blessed are you uh, when others revile you and, they, and you become the target of their abusive language. You're blessed. Reviling, gossip, Slander, insults, reproach, when someone mischaracterizes you and your intention, which they never have asked, you are being reviled. 
And what does Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes? This is what he said. There is a reward for those who are treated this way. So every time that you, and there's some lie that's hurled about you, every time someone has gossiped about you because of your Christian faith or because of what you're doing for the Lord, every single time this is taking place, they're just building up your treasures in heaven. That's all they're doing. They think they're bringing you down, but they're really lifting you up. You see, that's what was happening with Nehemiah. He knew God's will. He knew God's plan. He was pressing on and doing what God had called him to do. You see, there is a reward for those individuals who are persecuted. So when you're reviled for the correct reason, you receive a heavenly reward. The second thing we see about this planning process, a plan of action requires an evaluation of the situation. So what we see in this, in this account here. Uh, Nehemiah began a very careful evaluation of the city of Jerusalem. The text tells us he was there for a few days, three days, and he started to transcribe his findings. He began by noting the gates and walls of Jerusalem were destroyed. It was a shell of its former stately beauty. This destruction took place during the reign of King Zedekiah, some hundred, a hundred years Prior to this moment, this is when this uh, destruction took place. Zedekiah uh, was one of the kings in Jerusalem, and he started <laughs> listening to false prophets and made decisions which reflected a poor understanding of God's revelation. He was even selfish. He was proud, and he couldn't do the very basic things that the true prophets had told him to do. So due to this failure, Zedekiah, under his reign and under his tenure, God, who had been long-suffering with the nation of Israel, used this godless nation to come in and overtake the country. See, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple was, to, was perpetrated by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C. And we read about this in 2 Kings chapter 25. So for somewhere over a hundred years, this city was in ruins. We see in verse 13, this begins this account, he goes to the valley gate. This is probably located somewhere near the southeast corner of the city. He went to the Dragon Spring, which is one of the tributaries that gave Jerusalem and their inhabitants fresh drinking water. The Dung Gate led to the Valley of Hinnom. This valley south of Jerusalem is where, some, where it is very significant in the history of Israel. This is the place where the ancient Israelites, when they were disobedient to God, which caused them to be overtaken and destroyed by this pagan nation. The Israelites passed their children through the fire. And what does this mean? What does it mean when somebody passes their children through the fire? It means they give them up to the world. They sacrifice their children to the Canaanite god Molech. So Gehenna, as we see here, this valley of Hinnom, in the Greek it's translated as Gehenna. It continued to be an unclean place used for burning trash, burning rubbish for the city of Jerusalem. Jesus used Gehenna as an illustration for hell. So just as the name Dungate implies, it indicates a place where, where the city would take its refuse and a place where there was burning of sewage, burning of flesh and garbage. It was a place of utter filth. It was disgusting. It had a repulsive smell to the nose. Um, there were maggots who, which crawled around and worms crawled around. So Gehenna is portrayed in a very vivid sort of manner. And we see that Jesus uses this imagery in the New Testament as he reveals what hell is like. A place of eternal torment. A place of constant uncleanness. A place where the fire never ceased. A place where there's burning and the worms never stop crawling. So Jesus used this idea of Gehenna to say this is what the end of those who do not have Christ in their life. The ultimate end of those individuals is this place. We see it here in the Valley of Hinnom. We see it in Gehenna. We see this portrait of this disgusting, nasty place. In the Greek, this word translated in Mark 9, 47, hell. It describes the occupants of the lake of fire, Gehenna. These individuals in hell, they're separated from God for all of eternity. And this is reserved for the devil and his angels. This is reserved for those who do not know Christ as Lord and Savior. This is reserved as a place of eternal punishment. You know, sometimes we think that uh, 
You know, uh, we talk about people escaping the punishment, you know, just turning to Christ because they escape punishment. I'm, that's a good reason, but it's not the only reason. The reason we even worry about this, we tell people that that's where they're in. But in reality, our focus should always be meeting Christ as Lord and Savior, being sick of our sin, being sick of our condition, and needing a Savior. So this is the Valley of Hinnom. The portrait of hell. And it lay, it was still burning. It was still rumbling. It was still destroyed. But verse 14, as Nehemiah continues his journey, he's, he's at the fountain gate. This led to uh, the southeastern corner of Jerusalem, which led to the king's pool, which is quite possibly the pool of Siloam. The pool of Siloam was, was fed by an aqueduct that was uh, created during the reign of King Hezekiah. And this is a significant place in the New Testament. In John chapter 9, verse 7, Jesus healed a blind man here at the Pool of Siloam. Verse 15 says that Nehemiah inspected the walls. The homes on the side of the city were terraced down, the, down into the valley. And so when the wall was destroyed, all these homes collapsed. They fell on top of one another, creating this enormous amount of debris. This is a portrait of utter destruction of the city. This is a portrait of really a, a city that was once a, once a tremendous blessing. Think about the Temple of Solomon where people would come for, for, for all over the area. They would come to see this temple and all that God had blessed them with, all the gold. All the things, and it had moved from the pinnacle of that day to this place now where it was crumbled in ruins. It, it stood as the highlight. It stood as the pinnacle. It stood as the best, but now it was in ruin. And it was simply because the people of God had sinned and strayed away from God. So here he is, he's inspecting these walls. Verse number 16 says he met with the officials. He met with the nobles. He met with these individuals. He met with people who could help him enact this plan that God had laid out for him. But it took his evaluation of the city before he could move forward with the plan. Finally, we read about this third naysayer. We see Geshem the Arab. Um, and this, if it's the same Geshem that's nor, uh, mentioned historically in extra biblical writings, he ruled a league of Arabian tribes uh, in northern Arabia. In essence, he was an Arab, or you know, precursor to the modern Arabs we see today. So we see these, these three men. We see these three naysayers who came up against uh, Sambalat, or excuse me, came up against Nehemiah. These men were all stalwart men, strong leaders, well-respected. These were all good, uh, good men, so the world would say. But they were naysayers. These were three men who uh, Alistair Begg calls the unholy trinity. These three naysayers ruled the area, which laid in ruin for many years. And they didn't care to do anything about it. They all came against Nehemiah, the man God had appointed to the task of rebuilding the walls. They stood in opposition to God's work. They mocked Nehemiah. Together, these three, they, they formed a coalition to represent their contempt. It was the contempt of the nation surrounding Jerusalem and the territory of Judah on all three sides. Samaria to the north, Ammon to the east, and Arabia to the south. So, so Jerusalem was pressed in on all sides. They were crushed. They maybe felt forsaken, but Nehemiah knew that God was in, in charge. He knew God was sovereign. He knew God was in control, and he continued to persevere. These, these three men... They challenge him, and they ask, what is this thing that you are doing? They're, they're questioning his motives. They're questioning his intention. They're questioning what he's doing. And all the while, we see the story. All the while, we see that God was in it. The proof is in what God was doing in the other areas. But here was Nehemiah. He had to contend with these three men. They said, are you rebelling against the king? The leaders of the opposition, there were really this. 
they were guilty of the very thing which they were accusing Nehemiah of. They were guilty of the very things that they were saying about Nehemiah. All Nehemiah did, he was dumbfounded. He said he just assumed everybody would want the city to be rebuilt. But that just was not the case. So here were these three men, their countries. They were aware that Nehemiah was acting with the king's authority. So typically, naysayers, they try to drum up things to make their accusations, jealousy, and their assaults seem more viable. That's what they did. They were, they were calling into question his character, calling into question what he did, calling everything about him into question. You see, these men, they were merely raw and unable to accept God's plan and, and his timing. How do we know that Nehemiah was God's man? It's in the evidence of what God was doing around him. God had, God had touched the heart of Artaxerxes. In a few chapters, we'll see how God started touching the hearts of the people, how God started working. How do we know that Nehemiah was God's man? Because God's work started flourishing. Another evidence of God's blessing is the assaults of the adversary. Listen to me carefully. When someone's being assaulted uh, for, for standing by the word or standing on God's promises, it doesn't mean they've done something wrong. We automatically think, oh no, what have they done? Well, it means they've done something right. They've stood firm in God's plan. And so how do we know that, the, uh, that God, Nehemiah was God's man? because of the assaults that came up against him. The enemy didn't like what he was doing. So my question today is this, how do you know you are serving the Lord well? How do you know you're serving the Lord well? Assurance of our faith is something that's cultivated and it grows deeper and stronger over time. It's not something that happens overnight. It is a gift that God gives us. According to John Newton, evidence of God's favor is revealed gradually through frequent testings. Newton captured the meaning of Paul in Philippians 1.21, where it says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And it was in his book on the Christian life that he said this, assurance grows by repeated conflict, by our repeated experimental proof of the Lord's power and goodness to save. When we have been brought very low in health, sorely wounded and healed, cast down and raised again, have given up all hope and been suddenly snatched from danger and placed in safety. And when these things have been repeated to us and in, in us a thousand times over, we begin to learn to trust simply to, in the word and power of God beyond and against appearances. And this trust when habitual and strong bears the name of assurance for even assurance has its degrees. So how do, we, how do we know that we're doing the right thing? It's when we have to rely on the Lord. When we have to, we have to be encouraged by Him and Him alone. When there's no one else to do it and there's nothing else you can cling on to, that is when we need the Lord. That's when He grows us the most. That's when He matures us. You see, God's way of growing us is through sweet assurance. And he does this by putting us through numerous and varied and many hardships. The process is designed to be hard. Oh, how God must want to refine you because he hasn't made it easy for you. See, trials are the way that faith is proven, the way faith is refined and the way it is strengthened. This is why James wrote, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Difficulties doesn't mean you're wrong. Difficulties mean that God is refining you. Difficulty doesn't mean you've gone down the wrong path. In fact, it probably means you're doing the very thing that God wants you to do, and the enemy is pushing up against you. See, Nehemiah, he had his unholy trinity, Three powerful and stalwart men, and you too will have adversaries or even mighty situations which come up against you and test you, even though you are serving the Lord with <clears throat> diligence. So Nehemiah, he tackled the mission God had for him. His zeal wasn't expressed by blindly running into the situation. 
He carefully and he thoughtfully evaluated the situation. Even in the midst of evaluating a difficult situation, it may morph, it may grow, and it may change. Our task is to continue to seek the face of the Lord, to continue to look for the Lord to guide us. Clearly, we observe Nehemiah's desire to embrace a God-sized vision and logically plan and proceed forward. Careful evaluation may be necessary and is necessary to fulfill God's plan, but situations may change. But God's plan never changes. Our strategies, our tactics may change, but God is always the same. He's always in charge. He's always in control. And he always wants his way. He always wants his plan. And you and I, we must fall in line. You see, the unholy trinity made this situation about their little kingdoms here on this earth. But Nehemiah, he remained true to God's plan. See, there's a delicate balance between godly control and human effort. And that's why it must be immersed in prayer. That's why we must be cautious. That's why we must proceed forward at the appropriate time. As Christians, we must be observant of God, His intentions in a situation, and follow the leadership that God lays out for us. So today, as we think about this, this story in Nehemiah, this account, this chronicle, so many applications for us even in our day and age. Maybe you have been uh, the subject of, of a naysayer. Maybe someone has come up against you and assaulted you, not physically. Maybe you have had to stand firm because of your commitment as a Christian. Well, recognize this fact that every Christian goes through this. Every Christian experiences it, these sorts of difficulties. It's a matter of trusting the Lord even in these difficult times. So today, I want to issue an invitation to you today. You know, as I talked about Gehenna and the Valley of Hinnom, it may be today that you realize that, you know, the sin in your life has pushed you in that direction. And you've never met Christ as Lord and Savior. Then today, take an opportunity to come and take my hand, either now or at the end of the service, or when we're standing outside, let me introduce you to the Savior. And Christian friend, this is, a, this is an encouragement to press on. This is an encouragement to persevere. There are naysayers. There are difficulties. There are problems. But it's just normal. God allows those things to shape you, to refine you. To bring you to the place where you are more like your Savior. I don't want the difficulties. I don't want the problems. I don't want the pain either. But truly, for the Christian, the joy is that even those things, even those, those items are going on, we can press on and know that the hand of our Savior is always ready to help. So this morning as we close during a time of decision, won't you put your hope in him? And Christian friend, I don't know where you're at, but if you're going through a difficult time, God's refining you during this time of decision and this time of invitation. Won't you surrender the control of your life to him? If you would please stand as we close in prayer and sing our hymn of decision. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you just minister to us today. Lord, as we've heard this, this account in Nehemiah and what many applications there are for us where we're at at Mountain Rest and us individually in this passage of Scripture. Let us remember the truth, Lord, that you are sovereign even in those difficult times. And it's our task to learn to cling on to you. I pray that during this time of decision that all of us here this day would truly make that decision to grab hold of your hand and hold tightly even in the difficult times. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.